we're not just natural beings. We're spiritual beings. And just as much as our natural body needs food, our spiritual body needs food as well. The only thing is we're accustomed, we're tuned in to the response of our body when it's hungry, but we may not necessarily be tuned in to the response of our spirit man when we're hungry. Let, let me give you some, some keys that you know when your spirit man is starving. When you enter a worship service and it's going and the presence of God is there, but you just don't feel like lifting your hands. You just don't feel like worshiping God. You just don't feel like giving him your own. What is that? Your spirit, man, he's hungry and he's tired and he's weak and he's allowing your flesh to dominate your spirit. When you wake up in the morning and you say, I just don't feel like praying. I, don't just, I just don't feel right now like, like worshiping God. Is that true? No, of course you feel like it because you know prayer is powerful and you know that prayer transforms your life. But your spirit, man, he's so hungry and he's so weak that he can't pick himself up or herself up to take hold of the things that will nourish it. It is so important that we realize God's word builds me up. The Bible says that God's word is the bread of life. Satan came to Jesus and he said, hey, Jesus is on a 40-day fast. I don't know, no hunger like that. But Jesus was, he was just going for it. He was about to change the world, so I guess he just had it. And he was just, you know, he was hungry. And Satan comes to him and he says, hey, I know you're hungry. Change this stone into bread. And Jesus looked at him and he said, let me tell you something. I am hungry. And I would really like to have some bread right now. But man does not live on bread alone. But on every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, Jesus said, there's a food that is more important to me than physical food. And that's the food of the Spirit. The Bible is also referred to as the living water. When we receive God's word, we're refreshed. A lot of times people leave out of church and they'll talk to me in the lobby or something like that. And they'll say, man, I feel so much more refreshed than when I came in. I, I feel like a weight lifted off. I feel almost like I had a hot shower. They may not say it that way, but that's what the word of God is. It refreshes us. The Bible says that we can wash in the word, that it brings life back to us. So another place, the Bible says that God's word is the breath of God. All God's word is God breathed. God's word is bread. God's word is water. And God's word is breath. Now think about this. How long can you go without bread? How long can you go without food? Most people say, you know, right around 40 to 80 days is how long a human being can go without food, depending on their health and their age and all that. About 40 to 80 days is how long you can go without food. How long can you go without water? Most people say, you know, it's about, uh, I believe it's 7 uh, to 14 days that you can go without drinking anything. About after that, depending on your health, you're going to start looking kind of droopy. And then we're going to have a revival and raise you from the dead. <laughs> How long can you go without oxygen? How long can you go without breath? Navy SEALs, probably some of the most fit in our country, they can go about four minutes. I believe the Guinness Book of Record is about five minutes or something like that. After about five minutes of not breathing, yeah, it's going to be a problem. My question is, how many malnourished, dehydrated, suffocating Christians are out there because we don't receive God's word on a regular basis? Sometimes we wonder, why is it so difficult for me to run after God with all that I have because you're not feeding yourself? You don't have the energy that is necessary to finish this race. It is so important that we have God's word in our life for ourselves. I'm so happy that you come to church on Sunday. It's important that you come to church on Sunday, but nobody eats once a week, amen? Every single day. If you're like me, often, quite often, like a few times a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, half breakfast, half lunch, half dinner, snack, break, happy hour, whatever it is. Eat, 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 eat. That's how we should be in the word of God. Amen? But here's the thing. God's word is spiritual. It's not natural. One of the problems is when people approach God's word as an intellectual book instead of the supernatural holy Bible of God, when we look at it and we don't see anything, we just put it aside to saying, hey, it has nothing for me. 
But it's so important that we realize that God must open our eyes through the Holy Spirit to see his word according to what it is. I want to show you something that God opened my eyes to. In a, it was Isaiah chapter 7 verse 15. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 15. It's going to pop up on the screen and it says this. Curds and honey he shall eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Curds and honey he shall eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Now when I read it, I was looking at it the same way you're looking at me right now. Huh? <laughs> Uh, what does it have to do with anything? I said, God, this makes absolutely no sense to me. I don't even know what curd is, but I know that there's some type of revelation in this verse. God, speak to me through this. So I began to pray and I began to search through the Bible and ask, okay, God, what, what are you saying here? And after a little bit of research, I realized that curds is curdled milk, that, that it's stale milk. So I started looking through the Bible for where milk and honey was mentioned. Anybody remember anywhere in the Bible where milk and honey was mentioned? In Leviticus and all throughout the Bible, but in Leviticus in particular, verse 20, verse 24, it says this. But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. Someone came to me after the first service and said, I know about milk and honey. They were rapping about it on that Sugar Hill album. You don't know anything about that, though. You're too young for all that. But they said, we're not going to stay here in the hood. We're going to the land flowing with milk and honey. I said, oh, it's not in my Bible, but that works out. <laughs> this is what milk and honey represents. Milk and honey represents the promised land. God says, I'm going to take you out of Egypt and I'm going to take you into a land that is flowing with milk and honey. Milk and honey represents all the promises of God. So let's go back to Isaiah chapter 7 verse uh, 15, I believe it was. He says, I eat curds or milk and honey and it keeps me from evil. This is what Jesus was saying. When I keep my eyes on the promises of God. When I keep my eyes on the destiny that God has for me, when, when I see all that God has for me, it helps me avoid sin because I know sin causes me to forfeit what God has for me and I can see what God has for me so I'm not going to mess with sin. All of a sudden that's a verse that applies to my life. How can I avoid sin? Keep my eyes on my destiny. Keep my eyes on the promises that God has for me and it will help me avoid. The Bible says this, that he looked at the cross, but he looked past the cross at the joy of us on the other side. Jesus focused on his destiny and it kept him on track. What we need to pray is, God, when I read your word, let me not just see it for what it is, but open my eyes that I can see it as a supernatural spiritual book that it is, that it can bring a life and strength to me, that I can accomplish all that he's called me to accomplish. Somebody say amen. The second thing I want you to write down is this. The word is powerful. The word is powerful. Powerful. That verse says the word is powerful, that it's living, that it's active, that it's sharper than a double-edged sword. In uh, Isaiah chapter 55, it says this. In verse 10, it says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God was saying this. He says, my word brings results. He says, when I send my word out, it does not fail, but it comes back and it accomplishes exactly what it was sent to accomplish. One of the most difficult things for me is when I'm sent on supermarket errand runs. Maybe something's missing for dinner and my mom will say, hey, I need you to run out and I need you to buy me this spaghetti. Now, I need this brand. I need this type. I don't want thin spaghetti. I don't want linguine. I want this spaghetti. 
and I'll say, I got it. Do you want to write it down? No, I don't need to write it down. I have spaghetti. How hard can it be? It's just spaghetti. And I'll jump in the car and I'll go off and I'll make that first turn and I'll turn the radio on and they'll be talking about how awesome the Ravens are. And something about after that first turn, I'll forget <laughs> what type of spaghetti it was. And I'll get into the parking lot. I say, you know, how difficult can it be? As soon as you get in there, you'll know exactly what it is. And I'll go into the spaghetti aisle only to find out apparently there's a million types of spaghetti. There's thin spaghetti. There's thick spaghetti. There's brown spaghetti. There's white spaghetti. There's wheat spaghetti. There's all these. And I'm just like, oh, goodness gracious. I'm going to return void. <laughs> that had nothing to do with anything. God's word. He says, it accomplishes what I sent it to accomplish. It's not just an intellectual thing. It's not just a, a mind thing. God's word is powerful in that when we send it out, when we apply it to our lives, we see it come to pass. How do I apply God's word to my life? Easy. The first thing is this. Just do it. Look at the person next to you. Tell them, just do it. You know, I, I'm convinced that God made it simple and we made it difficult. I am convinced that all we have to do is obey him and everything he said will come to pass. But sometimes we say things like, okay, who exactly is my neighbor? What do you exactly mean by love them as I love by myself? No, you know, can't I love them as I love a friend? What do you mean by lay my life down? Like we, we want the fine print. God says, no, no, just do it. If I say honor, honor. If I forgive, forgive. If I say obey, obey. Just do it. When we apply God's word to our lives, we see God results. The second way we can activate the power of God in our lives is by what I call wielding the word of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about the armor of of God. And this verse is for all the men in the kingdom of God. God knows we like war and we like battle and we like blood and cutting and all this. So God says, this is exactly for you. I've given you the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes of the readiness of the gospel. If you think about the armor that God gives us in Ephesians chapter 6, all of it is for defense, except for one thing, the sword of the Spirit. Everything else, I got a helmet so my head won't get lopped off. I got a shield so I can protect myself. I got a belt so my pants can stay up. But there's only one thing that he's used for us to go on the offense. And that's the word of God. When we have God's word, it sends the enemy fleeing. Let me give you an example. When you step into a situation that may be overwhelming, that may not look according to God's plan, and you're just saying, hey, this is not working. If you have a word from God, God, you said in your word, with long life, you will satisfy me. And God, I'm not satisfied. So God, I believe based on your word that you're going to bring strength to my body. Or, hey, this marriage is not working and it looks like it's heading to divorce. But God, you said that you're able to turn the hearts of stone back to flesh. And God, I'm not looking at the situation. I'm looking at your word. And I believe that you are going to do what you said you're going to do. If you can see it in the spirit, you have a double-edged sword and you're starting to go like this way.